Do you think there could ever have been any hypothetical circumstances throughout like development of man that could have caused that to be kind of selected out and diminished in some way? That could have caused like the monkey brain to be smaller? Yeah, just like if we had truly created a society that was stable enough and self-sustaining enough and fulfilling enough that we just did not need the survival part of our brain to be that huge. Like we truly just, it, it didn't factor in anymore. Because as much as, you know, we're not running from a fucking lion every day or a saber-toothed tiger or whatever nowadays, there are so still situations where like that impulse still comes into play. Like we're all still threatened. There's still kind of predation that happens all the time. Like it just takes on different forms as we kind of evolve and have different technologies and different um, norms and things like that. But do you think like if we had created some kind of a utopia like thousands of years ago, like at the first iteration of society had worked, that we could have diminished that the way we lose our, our tails and things like that? And what do you think that would have looked like? Yeah, I I do. And I think that right now we're just not there yet. You know, we're not at the end of human evolution right now. But like, what would it take for us to to get to that point where that would even become a possibility? Well, I think that, I mean, definitely we should look further into spiral dynamics and, and do an episode about that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> But I think that, you know, what you're talking about is the development of community, the development of compassion, the development of safety, the development of people finding meaning in things other than just survival. Yeah. We're only a couple of thousand years into that. Yeah. <laughs> you know, we're only a couple of hundred years into not having to fear for our lives in the same way that our ancestors did. Yeah. So if our present day conception of society remains the same, then yes, I think that will happen. There's also a threat of like our pleasure centers becoming too demanding. Yeah. There's also the threat of being too reliant on dopamine throughout the day <laughs> yeah. and, and not reliant enough on real, I want to say like antagonistic stimuli that keep us striving for survival mm. so there's a balance there i think but what it looks like now is much different from what it looked like 300 years ago and that's what i think is so hard to conceptualize because when we when we think of it's very easy to like look back at like okay here are the founding fathers and they're the same people they're the same type of human that we are now and that's kind of true but not really our brains work way differently than theirs did in very subtle ways. But it's hard where we've even found ways of making, you know, the monkey brain parts, they correspond to pleasurable things in our lives like ambition. Yeah. And you'd have to have generations that are like kind of inert and satisfied for long enough, right? Like it's like nuclear disarmament. Like if everybody isn't at that point, then someone else is still going to be an apex predator and then they're going to win the evolutionary tug of war. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. We we only end up at Wally -E when technology <laughs> has taken care of most of our needs for us. Yeah. Ugh. I know, man. <laughs> <laughs> it's scary how possible that like that part of it seems. Yeah. I guess maybe I'm even just projecting when I ask these kinds of questions cuz it's I like it, you know, as much as this shit ravages my life. Like, I don't like the anxiety. I don't like the panic. It, it's a constant thorn in my side every single day. Mm -hmm. But I like being in the fray, you know? I like I like the human condition. Yeah, I do too. So, so I love to hate it, you know? <laughs> it just feels like you're a part of something. <laughs> Christ, well, I'm broken, yeah, dude. Yeah, you know, it, it's... I've been doing a lot of writing... Recently, I haven't really written much fiction, but when I do sit down to write, I kind of reflect on my story and I kind of reflect on what I've experienced that has made me not want to define my life by my suffering. Mm -hmm. What gets really hard is not defining your art by your suffering. <laughs> yeah. And 
I still don't know that I know how to do it. I do know that I don't write very personal lyrics anymore. And um, I like when music feels liturgical in some way. I like when music feels contemplative. I don't like when it feels necessarily angsty and... <laughs> What's a bigger word for venting? <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, I can't think of it. Uh, um, <laughs> <laughs> but I don't like when it feels like self involved, kind of. Yeah. But yeah, a lot of what I'm trying to meditate on recently, and a lot of what I'd like to do more writing about, is how to move on from. The kind of thinking that, like, I guess it's, it's certainty and doubt again, mm -hmm. you know, how to move on from the certainty that your suffering is the only way that you can be creative mm -hmm. and how to move on to a place that allows you to have faith or have hope or be optimistic, coupled with the doubt that you've actually stopped suffering or coupled with the doubt that your identity does not depend on your downfalls yeah, or does not depend on your betrayals or your fears or the ways that you've been hurt in the mm. past, you know, that takes a tremendous amount of faith. Yeah. <laughs> and it is fueled by a tremendous amount of doubt for sure. Yeah. But what you shouldn't feel is the certainty that looking at suffering as inspiration is a good thing because historically it is <laughs> Histor <laughs> like historically we look at we look at suffering as the impetus for expression yeah but that's not all that needs to be expressed well i think defining suffering too is is kind of critical in these conversations because like it gets a bad rap as like this holding pattern, this kind of like sexy, like emo thing where you get to walk around and sulk and shit. But it's like, I don't know. I've started to realize lately that suffering is just that void and that kind of yearning, like the kind of suffering that at least I've always written about is always, I'll put whatever mask on it that I need to like make the song work or something. Like it might be heartbreak. It might be existential pain, whatever, but like, it's always just about some void that I'm yearning to fill. And there's no way in hell I'm ever going to be, if I'm still pushing that envelope that I feel for some reason that I need to push um, in my own, like trying to like understand myself, it uh, will never totally be filled, you know, but it will change. And um, I guess, you know, like a physical analog to it would be like, I've always heard uh, interviews with Jack White where I think he's actually reckoning with this more recently too, but he was saying like how he deliberately makes his recording circumstances more difficult because he feels that he's being impure in some way if he's not making himself challenged at every turn. And so he'll pick guitars with wicked high action and he'll record only to tape and it can only be like one continuous take or something and use defective equipment and like, you know, just screw himself at every turn because he feels like it's not challenging. But I've always kind of looked at it like, well, maybe it's just not challenging. Maybe you're just good at the thing you were trying to get good at. Or maybe you're you're not looking in a new corner anymore because you've been looking in this corner for 10 years. You know, it's like, there's nothing wrong with that, you know, but I promise you there's still challenges out there. I was thinking about it actually on a run the other night. It was like, it's like if you run three miles every single day, you're eventually going to get in shape and that's going to be easy and that's going to be boring. So the solution that like that mindset would tell you to do is to like, all right, like when that starts to get easy, like hit yourself in the leg with a hammer really hard in the middle of your run. So it gets difficult again. The other solution is to just run four miles the next night. And I feel like it's the same with creativity and with, with even suffering. It's like, if you're not finding whatever that pain represented underneath the rock you're looking under, and flip over another rock and kind of treat that pain as what it is, which is something that you should work through and you should grow from. And that's obviously not true of all types of pain or things like trauma, for example, or, you know, they're more involuntary, but as far as that kind of wandering pain, 
that tends to be attributed to like inspiration in like an artistic way. That's always out there. Well, you said suffering as a holding pattern, which reminded me of some conversations we've had about nihilism. Yeah. And whether nihilism is, is a holding pattern or, or is it like a way of life? I think those two are the same thing. Mm. You know, I was reading recently that nihilism is never supposed to be a whole, uh, a, um, you know, it, it, it's a holding pattern because it's the beginning. It's not a conclusion. Yeah. Nihilism is never a conclusion because nihilism seen as a conclusion is too easy. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know? And it's supposed to be hard to work your way from nihilism to um, finding meaning. And there are like some theories that, you know, nihilism is healthy because, you know, then you have to come to terms with nothing. Then you have to be comfortable with nothing. Yeah. But that still feels like a holding pattern to me, <laughs> you know? So in, in the same way, suffering should be the beginning. Suffering yeah, yeah, should yeah. be where you start, which yeah. kind of seems like a counterintuitive thing to say because it, it also starts from something. But suffering should be where you start in that you work your way out of it and you find meaning in it and then you sh can share that meaning with people. You can discover empathy in other people's experiences. You can discover empathy in other people's art. And then from the point of view of the artist, then you can make it your goal to cultivate that empathy yourself. Yeah. From the point of view of not the artist, just somebody who happens to be suffering, that's not how you define yourself and that's not how you define your philosophical perspectives. Mm. You know, that's the, that's the impetus where you start looking for other philosophical perspectives that help you cope with the suffering. And then eventually it's no longer suffering. Eventually you perceive joy in the knowledge that other people suffer as well. Yeah. That's a beautiful thing. And that's like you're harnessing some of those survival instincts and some of those very human traits. Because if, if you, you know, you're dropped into a, a pit of despair like that, you need to survive. You need to get through it on some level. So you start looking for those bits of light and start looking for those bits of being able to relate to your fellow man and ways in which you need to get stronger to get through it and understand your circumstances better. And all of that starts to come together into whatever it's going to be. You know, for a lot of creative people, it might be a record or it might be a, I don't know, something beautiful, really. Like in a lot of cases, as it has been with, with artists. And then you get out and you kind of go to the next thing and you wander a little bit and you're a little bit stronger from that and you relate to people and you help other people who find themselves in that situation. Now they have more resources when they're trying to get out. And, you know, we're all just kind of moving along the same treadmill. So it's like, that's why I don't, I don't think suffering is an inherently bad thing. It's an unpleasant thing, but it's, it's natural to be, find yourself in circumstances where you're kind of off the reservation a little bit and you're, you're freaked out and you're hurt and you're alone. And yeah, you might objectively be those things, but then that other thing starts to kick in and you start making it make sense. And that's the coolest part of it. And that's the way to make it useful. Yeah. And I think it's important to mention that when we speak of suffering, we're kind of talking about it in like the Buddhist sense mm. and not in the third world country sense. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. <laughs> oh God. Yep. We should yeah. definitely make that. I, I always get really, <laughs> I always start talking about this stuff and then I realize like, have I actually suffered? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, uh, no, you know, it, it's, it's inherent to humanity and we're talking about that, which is inherent and not that which is imposed. Well, I always feel more comfortable talking about something like suffering in an abstract, zoomed out way like this than I do in like specific zoomed in personal situations or something, because it's even in the context of your own life, that doesn't hold very much water for very long. You know, like when I think about how I was when I was 21, I was the most emo, like just like rolling my eyes at the world. No one will understand me. Like always suicidal, just all of that shit. And it was genuine, you know, I wasn't like full of it. I just, that was truly how I felt. It was horrible. And now I think back, I'm like, that seems romantic in comparison to what I feel now. Like that, I feel like that was some sort of 
beautiful tragedy as opposed to just this boring tragedy. <laughs> but it doesn't make it any less valid, you know? And it, that's such a slippery slope to be thinking, oh, well, I didn't understand suffering then and I don't understand suffering now and so-and-so's is worse. Because, I mean, some people are in way worse situations and that goes on up and down the ladder, you know? But it's like just kind of treating it for what it is, like realizing like in that moment I felt this way. Like, I wonder what that meant. And that's that's the context I've felt more comfortable with lately is just being curious about it in that way. Because even in the third world contexts, it still goes up and down that ladder. It's just that I don't I don't remotely have the tools or the, the context to discuss those things in any sort of a dignified way. I have absolutely no experience with that. And I'd be doing a disservice trying to pretend like I know. Yeah, no, nor do I have any experience with that. Um, what's interesting is that like people who are suffering currently in third world countries are very unlikely to suffer ever in first world ways. You know, like our human condition is different. Uh, like there is a Western human condition. You know what I mean? Yeah, for sure. It's almost like the Western human condition is in a result of having been conditioned to desire in a certain way. Yeah. <laughs> it's almost like we're conditioned to desire entitlement. <laughs> and and I think that that's where that suffering or where that like nihilism comes from. You know, like the first step into that suffering is no one is entitled to anything, but I'm for some reason on a lower rung. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah. Why can't I have nice things? You know, that kind of thinking. Um, the, the, the must be nice mentality. But I think that is just the beginning because then you're responsible for cultivation. Mm -hmm.